Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Las Vegas, Las Vegas Money Show. Hope you're having a good show. We are going to put on a good show for you here this morning. So the this workshop, uh, the best ETF ideas to buy now. And myself, I'm Doug Fabian, along with my three panelists, are going to give you our best ideas uh, for the current investing environment. We uh, will also take questions from the audience uh, about uh, any particular uh, aspect of ETF investing that you might have, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to make sure we give you some good ideas for your uh, investment portfolios. So I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves rather than me reading their bios and uh, talk a little bit about their firms and what they do. We're going to begin with uh, Steve McGee. Steve is on the end. And uh, Steve, we'll have you uh, lead things off for us this morning. Great. Uh, good to be here and good to see everybody. We've been coming out to the Money Show about five years. See a couple of familiar faces. My name, as uh, Doug mentioned, is Steve McKee, and I write the uh, Novo Mutual Fund Selections and Timing Newsletter. That's probably the one we're best well known for. Uh, it's got the number one rating from Holbert Financial Digest over the last 20 years. And then uh, a few years ago, we started working in the ETF market, and what we do is practice a proactive rotation strategy. And uh, what that means is that we, uh, we try to apply modern portfolio theory and the efficient frontier because we recognize that there's places where you're maximizing your return while minimizing your risk. And I think we all know if you've been investing longer than, uh, how long has this bull market been going on? Six years? If you've been investing more than six years, you know intuitively that uh, there's times to be in cash or there's times to be in bonds or there's other times to be in stocks. So our what I call our C metric sort of measures that and recognizes it and then we try to rotate through it. Uh, you can find more information at selectionsandtiming.com or we also began to apply this toward 401ks, this proactive rotation strategy. And so uh, you can find more information about that at 401kselections.com. And then, of course, you can call me 800-800-6563. So what are the best ETFs with all that in mind? Because what we, or what I will mention today, may change. In fact, the markets will change over the next six months, a year, what have you. But a year ago, it was sort of the REITs were the hot thing. And uh, since then, they've rotated down toward the middle of the pack. And right now, we sort of like the, uh, just generally speaking, the healthcare as well as the internationals. You know, the international markets have underperformed our market, the domestic one for, oh my, almost, uh, again, almost six years. But with, their, with the ending of our quantitative easing and the beginning of their quantitative easing, the assumption is, is if it worked well for us, it should probably work well for them. So you're seeing this shift in the money flows out of the domestic market. Our market sort of is going sideways, but China, Japan, the emerging markets, Europe is beginning to stir. So, Generally speaking, we like the internationals. We also like the healthcare and uh, uh, some of the pharmaceuticals. So a year ago was maybe the REITs. This year maybe the uh, internationals as well as the pharmaceuticals, healthcare. Uh, if you're a contrary player, the the ETFs that are bringing up the bottom, of course, are the uh, oil and gas, some of the uh, commodities. Uh, silver and gold, and uh, you may want to be very nimble if you're if you have a contrary bent that way. So, uh, if anybody has any quick questions about uh, what I just mentioned, feel free to ask. And then, if you have any uh, comments later, I believe we're going to be taking some questions as well later. Steve, just do you have any specific ticker symbols that you wanted to suggest for people? 
Sure. So in the, uh, in the healthcare area, I mentioned uh, uh, it's PSCH. That's the uh, Power Shares S&P Small Cap Healthcare. It's got a top ranking right now. Uh, the Power Shares Dynamic Pharmaceuticals, which is PJP. It also has a top ranking. Uh, for the international area, we like the Wisdom Tree International Small Cap Dividend Fund. It's DLS. Uh, there's a, an aggressive Guggenheim China Small Cap HAO, and then a couple of the Japan funds, DFJ and EWJ. Great. First one was P S C H. Paul, Sam, Charlie, Harry. Got it. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah, the Japan's one is the iShares Japan. It's the big old one. It's uh, E W J. And then uh, there's the Wisdom Tree Japan Small Cap Dividend. It's D F J. And again, we practice this proactive rotation strategy, trying to find the risk-adjusted relative strength leaders, and then we measure these, and then we change the portfolio as the months and years go by. Okay, great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Jeff DeMasso is our next panelist and speaker. Jeff? Thank you. So I'm Jeff DeMasso. Uh, I work at Advisor Investments. We're a registered investment advisor I'm based out of Newton, Massachusetts, so just outside of Boston. We manage about $3 billion for individuals. Um, I also co-edit the uh, independent advisor for Vanguard Investors. I've been working with Dan Wiener for about four years on that newsletter. Dan's been writing it for just about 25 years now. Uh, it's a newsletter looking at Vanguard funds, ETFs, and annuities. Yeah, that's it. Sorry about that. Is that better? Yeah. All right. I'm just leaning too far. So um, a quick recap for those in the back who didn't hear. I'm Jeff DeMasso. I work at Advisor Investments. It's an investment firm based out of, outside of Boston, Massachusetts. We manage money for individual clients. We manage about $3 billion. I also co-edit the Independent Advisor for Vanguard Investors. It's a newsletter that Dan Wiener's been writing for 25 years now. We look at Vanguard funds, ETFs, annuities. Uh, we have some model portfolios uh, that clients and subscribers can follow. Uh, I would add to that that we're completely independent from Vanguard. We are not paid by Vanguard in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we'll tell you what we think they do well. We'll tell you when we think they could be doing a bit better. Uh, we're really trying to direct people towards the best that Vanguard has to offer. Uh, philosophy and our kind of our approach to the markets. Uh, we've got a saying that we spend time in the markets, not timing the markets. What I mean by that is that we're long-term investors, so we're thinking of holding periods in terms of years, not months, days, or weeks. Uh, so we're trying to take a long-term approach, trying to think about investing through a market cycle. Uh, in terms of a couple ETF ideas that we like right now, uh, I'm going to echo uh, some, some of the same themes we just heard. We do like healthcare. healthcare. Healthcare is a sector we've liked for a long time. It's got a couple big secular uh, I guess tailwinds behind it. Uh, it's got a nice demographic component to it. Kind of the older we get, the more we tend to consume healthcare. Uh, so both in the U.S. and then in Europe, uh, the demographics speak well for healthcare. Additionally, it plays well with the emerging market theme. Emerging markets, as you move into the middle class more, you're going to spend more money, and often you spend more money on improving your health. So we think that is a nice tailwind as well. And then the third leg of the stool is really innovation. Uh, we've seen it a lot in biotechs recently, but it's got a nice, nice uh, kind of growth component as new drugs and new technologies come to market. Uh, you can catch some of that technology as well. So we do like healthcare. Uh, the ETFs I would mention are a little more broad-based uh, than the ones mentioned earlier. We do like Vanguard's healthcare ETF. The ticker there is VHT. V, Victor, Harry, Tom, VHT. Uh, Fidelity also has a um, healthcare ETF, Fidelity MSCI healthcare ETF. The ticker there is FHLC. Uh, both of them are kind of broad-based exposure to the healthcare sector. 
both uh, very cheap, about 12 basis points, 0.12%. Um, so cheap exposure, diverse exposure to the healthcare sector. Uh, we also do like international. Um, I guess as a contrarian play right now, I kind of lean towards emerging markets a little bit. Uh, Vanguard's got a great broad ETF in that space, ticker VWO. Uh, you know, while foreign kind of Europe and Japan have lagged US, emerging markets have lagged even more, so you can find some better valuations. There certainly are, um, you know, a few concerns with health with uh, emerging markets. Uh, whether it's commodity producers or commodity consumers, uh, there are some concerns about you know, how they're uh, impacted by changes in commodity prices. Uh, but I think that adds to some of the appeal in terms of you can get cheaper valuations. Uh, so a bit more of kind of a hold your nose and buy for the long term in that space right now. And the third fund I'd mention would be Vanguard Dividend Appreciation ETF. The ticker there is VIG. And this is going to be a U.S. equity fund. Uh, the, strategy, the way the index is built is it's picking stocks that have a history of growing dividends over time. So you tend to get high quality, large cap US companies. We call them you know, battleship balance sheet companies. These are companies that can grow their dividend uh, and should continue to do so in the future. We think within the US that's where the best valuations are is in that large cap, high quality companies. Uh, so that is three. I will stop there. Um, happy to take questions now or um, at the end as well. In the back. Uh, I have INDA in the fund. Would I encourage sir to maybe get out of that uh, for emerging markets uh, allocation and uh, maybe go into the BWO? Um, oh, I guess it kind of speaks to what size in your portfolio, you know, the positions are we're talking. So, um, you know, India's had a good run. Uh, the stock market's done well in the past couple of years. Um, I guess I don't have too strong of an opinion on India. I think it's got a, you know, if you're holding it for 10, 15, 20 years, it could be a really great holding. You know, a lot of large fund managers, Jeff Gunlock, uh, to name one, and several say, hey, that's if I was going to buy one market and close my eyes and look at it in 15 or 20 years, that's the one. So if you're thinking long term and it's a reasonable position in your portfolio, it might be worth, worth holding, but we tend to take a little more of a diversified approach than specific company specific country specific at our company, at our firm. Thank you. Yep. Additional questions for Jeff right now? Okay, well let's uh, we'll move on. Well, there'll be, you know, a time at the end for us to, you know, kind of open things up for the uh, uh, group to talk about different ETFs. I've come up with a couple of questions I'd also like to ask the panelists uh, so we can get uh, some more dialogue going on with the audience. Uh, n our next speaker is uh, Matt McCall, uh, and Matt, please introduce yourself and right. give us Th your ideas. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. As Doug mentioned, my name is Matt McCall. I am the founder and president of Penn Financial Group. Uh, I started that firm, a registered advisory firm, about 11 years ago. I uh, also own a publishing company called Point B Publishing. We publish a ETF newsletter called the ETF Bulletin, also a stock newsletter called uh, Future Stocks. And also every evening, Monday through Friday, 6 to 7, East Coast time, I uh, sit in with Charles Payne on the Fox Business Network and co-host his show. And if you don't know, we're doing a show live Thursday here. You probably walked by the sign many times. So if you didn't get tickets yet, I think it's sold out, but you could probably still get in. I suggest stopping by and, and watching the show. It's great. We did in Orlando, live audience. It was like a rock event. It was crazy. But I have a question for you because I'm going to get you involved here a bit. Uh, the retail sales number came out this morning. Not very good. And everybody's saying we have this pent-up demand, low gas prices. So everybody here drives, I assume. I haven't had a car in seven years personally. But most people here probably drive. What have you done with your gas savings? Raise your hand if you've saved the gas savings. Has anybody saved it? One person. So everybody else here spent their savings. No? How many people spend, you know, we save, save 50 bucks a month. Are you spending it? No. Can't even see it. <laughs> All right. Well, sometimes perception comes reality and you perceive you have more money. But apparently, according to numbers, nobody's spending it. The only place that people are spending it, restaurants and bars. So I guess you're treating yourself to some pizza and beer. So maybe you want to look at a restaurant stocks. Um, but into the ETFs, I just want to get a view because I, I felt the pent up demand was there and pretty disappointing numbers this morning. The market's flat on that news. So when it comes to what we do, we do more of a top-down approach. We look at the market as a whole, uh, both internationally and domestically, and break it down into sectors. And then if we, from there, for some of our clients, we'll, we'll pick individual stocks. 
but a lot of times we'll stop at, stop at that sector level and just invest in ETF because we feel reward versus risk, ETF oftentimes offers the best investment uh, opportunity. So within our newsletter, we have a couple that we own now. I'm going to share, I think, seven, seven ticker symbols here with you. And a couple of them are going to be niche ETFs, meaning very, very finite, looking at sectors within sectors, subsectors. One is cybersecurity. The symbol is HACK, H-A-C-K. I've talked about this on the TV show for the last few months. Stock's been, or the ETF's been amazing. It's a basket of about 30 cybersecurity stocks. And that is a trend to me in the top-down approach that we're looking at. It's a trend. I mean, it's not going anywhere. If you look at the numbers, the amount of attacks that have happened, the amount of attacks that are thwarted every single day by corporations, by the government, is absolutely amazing. So to even kind of conceive that people won't be spending money on stopping cyber attacks is insane. So if you want to invest in that niche sector, H-A-C-K, hack, is the best approach, in my opinion. Another niche one, and the, and the first two panelists mentioned healthcare, and I'm going to agree with them. And usually if we all agree, it's not a good sign. But I, I think we're okay here. Uh, I like healthcare as well. Within there, I like biotech. That's been my favorite. And I love the bears out there. I don't think there's any bears on the panel here today. But the bears have been calling for a bio, bio, biotech bubble for how long now? I mean, every time the biotech sector pulls back, I told you so, it's a bubble. Well, it keeps bouncing back. I like SBIO. What this is, it's a basket of uh, small mid-cap biotech companies. They must have at least one drug in phase two or phase three. Uh, at least $200 million market cap, no bigger than $5 billion market cap, and uh, it's a volatile ETF. I mean, this is, is a higher risk ETF, but it's going to narrow it down. It's top holding. Do you remember that drug that got bought, a company I bought out last week, 100% uh, premium? You probably saw it go across the ticker symbol, GEVA. That's its largest holding. So, of course, the, the ETF popped on that news. So, in this, you're, you're getting exposure to these, what we call junior biotech companies, without taking that risk. Because if you own just one of them and the FDA says, nope, we're not passing it, that could fall 80% in one day. So it is higher risk, but you're not taking the real big risk at an individual stock. Another niche ETF I like is the cloud computing sector, SKYY, First Trust Cloud Computing ETF. Look at the, the earnings from the, uh, the big names, Microsoft, Oracle, and you break them down into, into their divisions. What division is doing the best in every major tech company? Cloud computing. Uh, you see the rumors going across that Salesforce.com, CRM, is going to get bought out. We're going to see a lot more consolidation in this uh, niche sector, in my opinion. Uh, this ETF is trading just at a, a multi-year high while the market's pulling back a bit. So SKYY, again, if you want to play the niche sector. I like technology as a whole, but if you want to narrow it down a little bit more, I think within there, this is one of my favorite uh, sectors within technology. Uh, another uh, one is a IAT, Regional Bank ETF. This is trading just below a multi-year high, on the verge of breaking out, like a quadruple top. And what is going to force this to break out, in my opinion? Higher interest rates. Because for the regional banks, higher interest rates increase their margins, which increases the bottom line, which helps every company make higher profits, which in turn is what? Higher stock prices. So I think the regional banks are the best place to go. I love the big ones. We own JP Morgan, Bank of America. But within, within that sector, if you want to play higher interest rates, then you want to play IAT, in my opinion. Uh, another one, niche overseas, now we're going, uh, European banks. So whether you think the European economy is good or bad is irrelevant, in my opinion. Uh, the GDP numbers did come out this morning overnight, and they're actually really good. Spain grew by 0.9%. Who ever would have thought Spain would be going at 0.9%? So EUFN is the uh, European Bank ETF. A lot of the big names, ING, uh, Banco Santander is in there. Uh, and this is a play on the fact that the ECB is doing the exact same thing the Fed did for many, many years, knocking down the value of the euro. It hasn't worked the last month or so, but they're attempting to knock down the value of the euro, prop up the economy, whether it be artificial or not, the bank should benefit in that situation. Again, I don't care about the European, uh, the fact that unemployment rates 20% in Spain. Irrelevant. I'm looking at making money. Yes, ma'am. Oh, the, the symbol is uh, E is in uh, Europe, U is in uh, underwear, F is in Frank, N is in Nancy. Two more, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, overseas as well, uh, Hong Kong, EWH. I think if you're going to play China, I think Hong Kong's better. Uh, the eight shares are valued much uh, more attractive uh, than the, the shares in mainland China. So if you want to play that, EWH is my way to play. And back here, just for a broad-based one, we've owned this for clients for a while, the Qs, QQQ. I think the, the big, big name tech companies are undervalued here. I think they will hold up better if we do have any type of market pullback. I don't see anything major coming. Uh, but the Qs, to me, is a nice core holding uh, as far as technology is concerned. And then we'll take questions at the end then, I assume, Doug. Okay, yeah, okay. no problem. Thank you, Matt. Thank you.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of great ideas from the panelists here. Let me just give you a couple of comments just on ETFs in general. You know, when I got into the business uh, in 1979, no-load mutual funds were the new investment vehicle. Uh, at that particular point in time, only 5% of all mutual funds were no-load, and 95% were load. And the load at the time was 8.5%. So can you imagine, you know, on a $100,000 investment, paying somebody $8,500 to tell you where on the form to put your Social Security number? That's what was happening. And now we have a whole new innovation going on, in my opinion, with the world of exchange-traded funds. But exchange-traded funds require you to have a, a, a different knowledge level than you have when you're buying a mutual fund. Now, let me just say that ETFs have not had uh, that much success with the retail investing public. I was at the ETF.com conference in January, and the st statistics were that 50% of American households own mutual funds. Only 5% of American households own ETFs. So one of the things that I believe, and I manage money and I write a newsletter, I, I believe that your entire portfolio can be in exchange-traded funds. And you would be better off in, with your entire portfolio in exchange-traded funds. I would also challenge you that if you own any mutual fund, you're most likely being overcharged and underserved. So I suggest that you look closely at every single mutual fund that you own. And again, there's still some good mutual funds out there. but. You probably don't know what they're costing. You might not remember what they did in the last down market. Uh, and I have to tell you, would you drive across town to get gasoline for 50 cents a gallon? Well, of course you would. You know, gasoline in California is almost $3.80. When you take a look at the cost differential between the average mutual fund and some of the low-cost ETFs that are available, all of your portfolio should be in exchange-traded funds. Now, with that said, you need to, if you're using ETFs, build a portfolio. There's some positions that you want to have a larger allocation to. Uh, Jeff mentioned VWO. It was one of my ideas I wanted to share today. Uh, this is the Vanguard uh, Emerging Market ETF. This, in my opinion, is an ETF that would be a core holding in your portfolio. You could have a 10, 20, 30 percent position in VWO. But when it comes to hack that Matt mentioned, again, another one of my selections today, Matt, <laughs> uh, Glad I went last year, so I was able to come up with some new ideas. But hack as a position, that might be a 3% position in your portfolio or a 5% position in your portfolio because it is not diversified like VWO is. VWO owns over 1,000 stocks in 15 different countries. Hack is just 37 securities. Uh, and, and it's an excellent idea that I think has a great growth potential in the future, but you want to size it correctly in your portfolio. You don't want to build a portfolio that has 20 ETFs and they're all 5% size. That's not how a professional portfolio manager would put together a portfolio for you. So you have to realize that ETFs are not mutual funds and they're not individual stocks, but when it comes to you know, getting a core position in the U.S. stock market and you want to own the S&P 500, SPY, or if you want to go one step further, VTI, which is the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, well, if you had a small IRA account that you were managing for your son or your daughter, you could have 100% of that portfolio in that one security because it is fully diversified. You know, it's not some sector play or something like that. So you, you need to, you know, kind of understand that when you're building a portfolio of exchange-traded funds, there's some differences, there's some nuances, but boy, you can save a lot of money, you can have some transparency, you've got liquidity. There's really good things happening in the world of the ETFs. There are over 1,600 exchange-traded funds today. Now, one of the things that I have done uh, in not only do I have my newsletter, I think you have a copy of it in your lap, but I also have started a new website called ETFU.com, ETFUniversity.com. This is a place, and I've put up uh, eight YouTube videos that are lessons 
for people on how to build an ETF portfolio. Some people, and again, the money show is more sophisticated. Most of you have a brokerage account. Well, to the audience that I'm reaching with ETFU.com, people might not even have a brokerage account. So they need to understand how to open up a brokerage account or how to place a buy order or a sell order or what the difference between the bid and the ask spread is. So there are some nuances when it comes to exchange traded funds that you need to understand. But the most important thing you need to understand is they are the best deal on Wall Street. They are the most innovative product to come along since the no-load mutual fund. And in my opinion, you can have 100% of your invest in, investing portfolio in exchange-traded funds, and you should be telling your sons and daughters, kids and grandkids, to get on the ETF bandwagon. So with that background, let me talk a little bit about my investing ideas. Most likely, the majority of you have 70, 80, 90 percent of your investment portfolios in the U.S. You are a U.S. centric investor. There's a couple reasons for that. Most Americans hate to travel overseas. Okay, you know only 30 percent of us have passports. And if you go back to when you didn't need a passport to go to Canada and Mexico, there was only about 13 percent of Americans had passports. 50 percent of Americans have never been outside of the country. So you're very comfortable with your U.S. stocks. And we've been in this big, long U.S. bull market. Well, it's time to wake up and realize that the majority of the investing opportunity today, in my opinion, rests outside of the United States. Markets go through cycles, whether we look at the three key areas, the U.S. market, the developed markets like Japan and Europe and Australia, and then the emerging markets. If you look at those three markets on a 30-year basis, they compound all at 11% a year. They all do the same. Jeff mentioned that the emerging markets are the best value play out there because they have underperformed so much. And the same is true for the developed markets. So it is time for you to start thinking in terms of getting more of your portfolio invested overseas, and there is no cheaper or better way to do it than with exchange-traded funds. Now, let me talk about some investing ideas here. I'm going to give you a couple of single country ideas. I'm very fond of Asia. The reason why I'm fond of Asia is because they don't have the uh, social liabilities that the U.S. and Europe have. I'm talking about Medicare, Social Security, and the social safety net that exists in Europe. They don't have that burden. They don't have the debt load that exists in the United States and Europe. Uh, and in the case of China, they don't have Democrats or Republicans who have a tendency to just screw up everything. So I am a big China bull. I believe China has emerged into a new bull market. Very important, new bull market. Now, I realize that China has been up 100% in the past 12 months. If you go back from that market low, they had just gone through a 35% bear market over a three-year period of time. So they went through a very ugly phase. They, of course, crashed like everybody else in 08. They rose on a very aggressive stimulus package. And then with the change in government in China, everything uh, uh, basically fell back. And they went out of favor in the global investing community. Uh, and now they've started to reemerge here. There's a lot of change going on in China. China is the number one economy in the world. China has the largest population in the world. And the Chinese stock market uh, still has room to run. Now, in my newsletter, we have been recommending a share for nine months. We're up 90% in the position. And believe it or not, I still like a share, A-S-H-R. This is the Deutsche Bank a share ETF. This particular exchange traded fund has enjoyed a very nice run here. And let me tell you how you approach this. Let's just say that you want to build a 5% position, or maybe a 7% position. I currently have a 10% allocation in my newsletter. This is the way you need to think as an ETF investor. How big a position do I want to have in the security? And then you begin to get started. And 
the, the A share could correct 20% in the next 90 days. But that does not take away the long-term story on this bull market. So the way that I would go about investing, if I wanted to have a goal of getting a 5% position, is I'd take a 2% position in that ETF now. Well, if, the, if it goes down by 20% on a 2% position in your portfolio, it's 40 basis points of your overall return. It's no big deal. But you gotta realize that there is a big, big story in China long-term. They're making good reforms, and if it pulled back 20%, that's when you would want to add more to that particular position. But A share is my first selection. Second, I want to talk about India. Again, not picking on Jeff, but supporting with Jeff coming up with his ideas here today. Uh, he's, he commented about India, and I ha actually own INDY in my client portfolios, but India is by far my favorite emerging market long term. They've got the right demographics. They have a very young population. They have an educated population. They have a change in leadership. The gas price fall in India has been huge for that particular economy. And it's not at a 52-week high. The, 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 the ETFs in India have fallen 12 to 15 percent in the past 60 days. So I think this is a great time to get involved in India. The ETF that I have in my newsletter is EPI. This is the Wisdom Tree uh, earnings, and Wisdom Tree has a methodology for selecting stocks and their indexes based on earnings growth. But uh, it's a good methodology, and I think EPI is a good selection. INDY is good as well. But if you have no international exposure, I would go with VWO, okay? I, I, I mean, VWO has India in it, and I think it's uh, an excellent investing idea. But again, uh, I still like... Uh, EPI as uh, another idea. And then lastly, I'm going to mention, uh, again, I support the idea of hack. Uh, I, I've really looked closely at that exchange-traded fund and actually love the investing theme, and you're diversified in that uh, strategy and idea. But here is a new idea that uh, is an ETF that has just come out, and I've done some very deep research on this exchange-traded fund. This is also in the biotech space. And this is the Biotech Clinical Trials ETF, ticker symbol BBC, BBC. This exchange-traded fund has 67 stocks, and the two guys that are running this uh, exchange-traded fund they have a, a BBP, which is the uh, biotechs that have product on the market, and BBC, which are biotechs that are in clinical trials. One of these guys has a PhD. He's brought biotech companies public. He knows this biotech industry inside and out. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with these guys, and I'm very, very impressed with what they're doing. This is going to be a volatile position in your portfolio, but you're investing in American innovation. And in these 67 companies, there is the cure for cancer. That's what these companies are working on, those kind of big medical breakthroughs. And that's, the, you know, in, here in the United States, and again, biotech has been the number one sector off the market lows of 2009, but there is still some big, big upside in biotech. Again, from a position size standpoint, this would be like a 3% position size in your portfolio. This is not a 50% position size in your portfolio. So position size matters when it comes to ETF investing. So with that, let me uh, open it up for questions from the audience and allow the panelists to chime in. Can so, I say something real quick? Just, go, I'm going to go on, on top of you. Just not to make this a love fest here, because it seems like we all have like, the same things, but uh, what, uh, what Doug mentioned about position sizing, 50% versus 5%, that's something that I think a lot of individual investors don't get. They may hear a, a ticker symbol walk out and put 50% in a portfolio in a hack, let's say, and realize, wow, it's down 10% in a week, or because it could happen in that sector, Absolutely. and then get out and then lose a, quite a bit of money. So all of us, we do this for a living, but that is what we do. We help you position size. I mean, and that is key to long-term success. So I just wanted to piggyback what you said there, Doug, Thank you. how Thank important you, that is. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. I, I, the, uh, I, I know what the question is. There, there is a new, I don't know if it's a website or service, called Motif. And with Motif, 
you can basically build your own exchange traded fund. So I'll go first on that. I believe that most people do not have the time, tools, and expertise to pull that off, to be successful and make that happen. I think it's a very interesting idea, but I don't believe that it, it fits with, with most people. I, I'm going to kind of go along with Doug said. It's an amazing idea, and a lot of individual investors love it. The problem is uh, the people that get paid a lot of money and studied many years to do this often struggle to beat the market or to keep up with the index. And by giving a lot of individual investors that ability to do that, it's very dangerous because you must keep an eye on it and track it and, and rebalance it. And if you're not doing that, you can get a, in a heap of trouble. Jeff, comments on Motif? I have nothing to add. <laughs> Sound like a politician, like Tom, Jeff. Tom Brady. <laughs> Steve. So the concept is you go out and build a portfolio of individual stocks. Is that the idea? Yeah. The so how is this different from just going and building a portfolio of stocks? Well, without getting too deep into the concept of, of Motif, they've just made it very easy yeah. for you to be able to bundle, cut down on the transaction fees. I mean, it, that, that's, it, it basically makes it easy for you to create your own exchange-traded fund without transaction fees. That's a big part of their model. Am, am I right on that? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, on the surface, then, anything that's lower cost presumably might be a little bit better than something that does cost. Okay. Additional questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so about that, though, would, would you have bigger gains if you just had the stocks versus the ETF? Would that reduce? A lot of it would just depend on, you know, what percentage your portfolio is. If you, if you say, I want 20 stocks and you divide your portfolio 5% into each versus, you know, I love this stock and I've got half my net worth, um, I think. Buffett is sort of the uh, poster child for that. He's got, what, five positions that are half his portfolio. Um, and it's the old adage, put your eggs in one basket, but watch that basket. A lot of it just depends on how you're comfortable and what your acumen is. You don't want to go to the stock market and find out. Well, but you you when it comes to ETF investing, you cannot buy, as an individual, stocks in Vietnam. Very easy to buy the Vietnam ETF, but you know you're you're not in a position to buy China A shares. So, you know when you look at the big opportunities that the exchange traded fund world is giving you, in my opinion, much much of it lies outside of the United States, and you just cannot build a portfolio of individual stocks as an individual investor outside of the United States. So, that's my take. Yeah, and on, and on that last point, it's you know it's the same thing with hack. These people are professionals, they're doing it 24-7, they've got organizational and skills and, and contacts, so it's, it's difficult to uh, reproduce that personally. Okay, questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the ETFs, are they, you know, index ETFs, or do they manage the ETFs? No, they're all index products, so it's not an actively managed fund. None of the ETFs actively managed? Not a Vanguard, no. Okay. Yes, sir. Jeff, uh, last one you mentioned at the end of it was uh, either VIG or VIG. VIV with a V, Victor. VIV. VIG. VIG. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. How do you determine the amount of uh, percentage of ETFs you should have in your portfolio? What resource do you look at? In your well, that, that really is a personal decision. As I said, you can put all of your portfolio in exchange traded funds if you have it properly diversified and allocated. So, uh, you know, again, the other panelists might have a different opinion on that, but, you know, again, I, I, I just believe that for most people, they should have more than they have now in exchange-traded funds as a substitute for mutual funds and as a substitute for individual stocks. I'm talking about you know, individual ETFs. How much should you have uh, in that one particular ETF? Position size. You're talking position size again here. And again, I, I want to ask each panelist to comment on position size. I have uh, a terminology that I use called core positions and tactical positions. Core positions can be anywhere between 10 and 30 percent, and tactical positions, like the India position I mentioned, would be a tactical position. 
the hack position is a tactical position. So that might be in the 2% to 5% range. So let me get some other comments from the other panelists about that. Um, very similar to what Doug does. We have our core holdings, as I mentioned. QQQ would be a core holding. Up to about 15%. I usually don't go over 15% one holding, but I don't go usually below 5%. So Hack, Sky, those are all 5% holdings in a portfolio. We may start with two and then add to it, but typically I want to have at least 5% within what, what I call our Explore, outside the realm of the core holdings. Uh, Jeff, comment on position size. Yeah, I mean, same, same type of idea. We'll have position size a bit bigger, sometimes up to 20, 25, 30 uh, percent of a portfolio. But that's going to be your core. That's going to be U.S. stocks or maybe kind of core investment grade bonds, government, corporate, back, corporate mortgage backed securities. And then, yeah, you might have something that's a little bit smaller on the kind of explore tactical side. Steve, comments? Right, in the letter that we put out, it's a, uh, we have our core holdings. Uh, EEM, EFA, IWM, which is small cap, Russell 2000, QQQ, and then SPY. And what we do is allocate 15% into each of those five positions, and then we have another tactical or the more aggressive, so to speak, of that rotation strategy and we do the 4% in each of those positions, five of them. Now, now we realize too that you may have multiple accounts. You could have a Roth IRA with $20,000 in it. Okay, maybe you only need three ETFs in that particular account. It's a small account. I mean, we have different, you know, size portfolios in different accounts that we're managing. You might have three or four accounts that you have. So I, I tell some clients who are starting a Roth IRA, well, if you just made a $5,000 contribution, you can put that in just one exchange-traded fund. When you next make the next contribution the following year, you can select a different ETF, and you're building it over time based on the size of that particular portfolio. Ladies and gentlemen, we just have time for uh, one more question. Yes, sir, in the back. Okay. The gentleman's asking the question, you know, of these selections, how does the panelist uh, coach us relative to IRA versus tax taxable? Any comments on that, Matt? Well, you know, a lot of it comes down to we, most of us have newsletters, and that's going to be at your discretion to choose which ones go in there. We, most, like Doug and I have uh, money management services, so we would build that for you. But if it's going to be a dividend that's paying a high dividend, for example, typically that's going to go into your IRA, your tax deferred accounts, not paying a dividend. Maybe you go into the taxable. Or if you believe it's going to be a short-term hold and you're expecting a gain, maybe that goes into an IRA because you want that gain not to be taxed uh, within there. And real quick, uh, for the mention beginning, uh, I'm at booth 705 if you want to stop by afterwards, too, during the day. Jeff, any comment on? No, I think you covered that. That's fine. Uh, I just want to, my one comment on that is r remember that in, in terms of taxes, your taxable account, you have short-term gains, which are taxed at ordinary income. You have long-term capital gains, which are taxed at 15%. The holding period is 12 months. So like some of these uh, hack and the biotech ETFs we mentioned, that's where I would want to think in terms of a long-term capital gain. I'm going to be holding that ETF with the goal of getting over the 12-month period and maybe getting 20, 30, 40% returns in a three- or a five-year period of time. Then you have qualified dividends. Now, the ETF that Matt mentioned from Vanguard produces qualified dividends. Those are taxed at just 15%. So you could handle that in a taxable account. That's not egregious, unless you live in California and you have Jerry Brown as a governor. But, and then finally, your bond ETFs are the ETFs that throw off ordinary income. Those have got to be in the IRA accounts because you don't need more ordinary income. So that's my coaching on that. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I just want to say thank you for attending our workshop. Thank you to our panelists. And please uh, visit our websites and, and uh, say hello to us after the show. Thank you. Great job. Thank you.